Blessed evening to every one of you, my dear brothers and sisters who are avid students of the Word. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study night. And tonight, we will have uh, Brother 
Nathan Gordon to facilitate and teach the lesson in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And so to all of you who are here for the first time, thank God that you have joined. And I urge you that you listen to the end and focus. And if possible, if you have the material, the book, then after you have gone through this evangelistic uh, Bible study night, that you will read again and then you will be reinforced in your increasing knowledge of Jesus. And so, thank God we have a Wednesday Bible study night. Let us pray. Oh God, you are so marvelous. You are so fantastic. A God that despite of who we are, you have taken notice of us and considered us that you, O oh God, did everything to bring us back to you through our Lord Jesus Christ because you love us. And so tonight, Lord, help us to really focus that we will benefit from this and for whatever that you see in us that is not pleasing, we surrender them and we, we confess them that we are sorry, O oh God, that we have displeased you. And so tonight, Lord, we are believing, O oh Holy Spirit, that you will move among us, that we will gain something beneficial for our journey. And so thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us honor the Lord and let us worship him and join the music team. Hallelujah.
church and welcome to our wednesday bible study evening my name is brother nathan gordon and i'll be your host for this week and next week so um hopefully everyone is well settled um you've got your notebooks you've got your pens you've got your bibles you've got everything that you need in order to receive the word that's coming through today so firstly i just want to again reintroduce myself my name is brother nathan gordon i'm one of the primary leaders of pegasa center under the care of our dear pastor doc and um, I am privileged to be able to be here this evening to share this message with you all. Um, so again, I just thank God and hopefully you will receive something that you'll be able to apply in your lives. So I just want to thank our pastors, Pastor Doc and Pastor Ashe, for the privilege and for the opportunity um, to be able to share this message with you this week and also next week, Wednesday. And I want to acknowledge our other pastors, Pastor Gosh, Pastor... Ben for Pastor Doris, Pastor Alan, Pastor Asai, and all of our leaders in the G12 movement, and all of our Pegasa Center leaders within the primaries. So again, welcome, and yes, let's get started. So we will be um, studying First Timothy 4 um, for the next two weeks, and we'll be broken down into two sections, or two halves, I should say. Um, but today's harp is broken down into two further sections, so we'll be focusing on verses 1 to 10. So um, I will start by reading the first part, which is focusing on verses 1 to 5. Um, and it reads, and I'm reading from um, the NLT version. So again, this is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. So it reads, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, 
some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. They will say it's wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. Amen. So as I mentioned, this first part is going to be um, broken down into a couple of sections. So um, part A, I'm going to kind of like give it to you in this kind of way, is um, called ascetic heresy. Okay, so um, when I first was given this message to, to read, um, some of the words I was unfamiliar with, I was like, okay, let me do a bit of research into what this means. So, ascetic heresy. So, ascetic, to kind of define what each word means, is basically characterized by severe self-discipline and abstination from all forms of indulgence, typically for religious reasons. Or in other words, it's avoiding physical pleasures and living a simple life, often for religious reasons. Another definition that I found is one who is devoted to the practice of self-denial, either through seclusion or stringent abstinence. Okay, so that's what ascetic means. And heresy means, basically it's a belief or opinion contrary to orthodox religious, especially Christian doctrine. So, or it's the act of having an opinion or belief that is opposite or of against what is the official or popular opinion or an action that shows that you have no respect for the official opinion. And another definition I found is deviation from a dominant theory, opinion or practice. Okay, so part one of aesthetic heresy is abstinence. Cool. And there's two kind of like aspects to that also. So there's a source of what this is, and that is from deceiving spirits and the substance within the nine senses. So out of the first part of First Timothy 4, I've just read the verses 1 to 5, I'm going to focus a little bit more on verses 1 to 3. And that is focusing on the abstinence aspect. So again, it says, the Holy Spirit tells us that, that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow the sets of spirits and teachings that come from demons. Okay, so it's important that we actually understand what that is. So, we can use like an analogy of the shepherd and his sheep to kind of like break it down. And we know that a shepherd is in charge of ensuring the sheep are led in the right way, led to green pastures as we read in the word. Cool. And within the Bible, we have many verses which refer to our situations and our kind of like condition as us being sheep and Jesus being our true shepherd. And he's referred to that quite a lot. So with a sheep, with, with the sheep, they are very dependent, amen, on those on the shepherd. They they need to follow, they understand the shepherd's voice and they follow and depend solely on that shepherd. Cool. So they have such dependence on them. And the responsibilities the shepherd has is to ensure that the sheep are very well looked after. So there's again, like I mentioned, there's parallel aspects that link literal sheep to us as humans and who we choose to follow. So what we have to be aware of, especially what, like what it says in this verse, and this is Paul speaking to Timothy here. We have to be aware that amongst the sheep, there are wolves. But we must listen to the words of Jesus Christ, who said on the Sermon on the Mount that we must be aware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Cool. So this phrase is a metaphor about something that could never happen to ordinary sheep, but it does happen to the sheep of Christ's flock. Cool. So again, like it says at the beginning, it says the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. So again, if you look at that picture of the shepherd, and the sheep, the sheep following who they think the shepherd is, and some will turn away from that true faith and follow the set of spirits and teachings that come from demons. Cool. So again, continues to go on to say in verse 2 that these people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. 
cool so that's the source of where this the semen spirit comes from okay so there's a question that i have for you and it's a rhetorical one not something that you have to answer but what do wolves do and how they do it and why are people fooled so what do wolves do how do they do it and why are people fooled and the answer is a wolf according to jesus and paul is a man who infiltrates a christian church with false teaching so the tragedy is that this person could look like a sheep he may look like a christian and behave like a christian he could be nice he could be kind he could be friendly but the people will be fooled because he subtly distorts the truth and that is the way the sheep of god are fed with poison so we have to walk circumspectly like it says in the word we have to very be we have to be very aware of what the word of god is saying and our understanding of it this is why we need to be so consumed within the word of god um in my cell group i say to my and my cell all the time that the world that we're living in at the moment is very corrupt yeah it's chaotic there's loads of things happening um and again as pastor doc always preaches um that the end time is coming soon so we have to be ready and be prepared so if we are not equipped and we are not aware of what the word of god is saying we will not be prepared for that time when again we could be fooled by these demons who are wolves in sheep's clothing amen so a shepherd therefore has a double duty number one is to make sure that the flock could get the right food cool so the shepherd is ensuring that the sheep are well fed cool and again that could be physically with the food and also from our perspective it's that spiritual food so our pastors are like the shepherds yeah they are leading us into that right path and they are feeding us with the word of god with that spiritual food that we need cool and number two is to protect the flock from wolves and warn them of people who can confuse them so again one of the messages that we learn from our pastors and that i'm teaching at the moment is from the word of god there's always a reference there's always a biblical reference to what it is that we're teaching and what it is that we learn cool so it's important that we are aware of what the word of god is saying so we are ready and prepared if there is anyone that's going to come and try and confuse us it's so important that we put that working also so Paul teaches Timothy that the Holy Spirit says expressly that there will come days when a kind of subtle perversion of teaching will creep in through people who are so nice that you could be fooled and you can always test them by the word of God. You must not test them by their appearance or judge by the eyes because the Lord never does. It has to be by the word of God. And again, our opinions, our emotions, our assumptions can easily fool us but the word of god never lies and as we know in the word of god it says he has no favorites so he's not going to judge us by our appearance so we have to understand what the word of god is saying so if we are amongst these types of people that we may consider to be friends or consider to trust we have to be so sure that what they are teaching us is right amen and how else will we know is if we don't study if we don't read our bibles and again within our church we're so privileged and so blessed that we have devotional times that um every day we read our daily devotional and we study the word of god and we read the word of god that again it gives us that fuel that we need in order to continue learning and growing in that way at the same time we have our cell meetings which are important again every uh, member of our church is part of a cell group um, and we are training our cell leaders to become cell cell members, sorry, to become cell leaders. So this is important also. So we are well equipped. We have our equipping track. And again, we've got our life class starting back soon. So if you are interested, if this is your first time here, um, life class is an equipping track. So basically it's a series of lessons that we learn, which strengthen and allow us to grow even more in our faith and give us the information and the food in which i'm speaking about today in order to be well equipped and well prepared 
Amen. So we've got live class starting soon, which um, again breaks everything down so simply and it goes through a series of weeks. Um, so if you're interested, please reach out to the person who invited you today or just drop a comment um, in the chat and someone will reach out to you and give you the information that you need. Um, cool. So um, this is again, just to kind of like um, back up what I'm saying, the importance of us really understanding what the word of God's saying, because we could be surrounded by wolves in sheep's clothing. So verses one to five are concerned with a particular heresy. So a falsehood, like I defined heresy earlier, the de deviation from a dominant theory, opinion, or practice or falsehood, which has already gotten to the church. And that is, Gnosticism. Okay, so again, this means um, or is defined as a second century religious movement whose followers believe that knowledge and a pure life could free people from the material world which was created by an inferior god called a demiurge. So if you put the, the, uh, the letter A in front of the word, it becomes agnosticism, which means <laughs> the beliefs of someone who does not know or believes that it is impossible to know if a God exists. Or in other words, a person who holds the view that any ultimate reality such as God is unknown and probably unknowable. So broadly, one who is not committed to believing in either the existence or non-existence of God or a God. A person who is unwilling to commit to an opinion about something, political agnostics. So they are popped in the church um, and again claimed to be Christian agnostics. So that is like talking about a square circle. So having a different opinion from everybody else. So Jesus came to bring us the truth and the truth sets us free and we know whom we have believed we are not agnostics. Okay so but in those days there were Christian agnostics which means the Christian knowers. So they were teaching that the physical and the spiritual can never meet. That is um, the physical is evil and that the spiritual is good and that you must keep the two things widely separated not allowing your spiritual life to interfere with your physical life. And if you go to verse three through five, it says that is, um, so they will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks for we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. So there are two extreme effects if our spiritual life has nothing to do with our body, but only our soul. So number one is that the spiritual life having nothing to do with the physical. So overindulging your body by saying it doesn't matter as long as I say my prayers, I can do what I like with my body. So this could lead to extreme immorality. Or it could go the other way. And you can say, if I'm to be a saint, I must do everything I can get to rid of my body of its appetites. I must sit on the bed of nails. I mustn't get married. I must stop eating this food. I must stop drinking that drink. I must mortify every desire of the body if I'm going to be free in the spirit. Okay, so those are two extreme kind of circumstances that people can look at this perspective from. But then there are those who have made laws and rules and sought an ascetic life, which denies the things of the body as being good at all. So in the matter of sex, there are those who think that provided they pray, witness and worship, they can do whatever they want. On the other hand, are Christians who think that sex in itself is dirty and sinful. Although it was ordained by God, it was, again, something that God has given us because he said that we have to be fruitful and to be multiplying through marriage. Okay, so 
These extremes are due to the fact that the spiritual and physical have not been kept together. But Paul says, glorify God in your body. Know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Keep the spiritual and physical together. So this particular heresy that Paul mentions, the aesthetic self-denying kind that says, if a thing of the body must be bad, if your body wants to do something, that must be sin. This idea comes from demonic spirits who get hold of people and then sear their consciences. So the examples of certain foods and sex and all that kind of stuff being bad, again is something that could be what causes people to stumble as an um amen because it's from a perspective of again being led in the wrong direction being led in the wrong way um so if you start to say you must eat this and you mustn't eat that then you fall into the trap of asceticism so considering drink Drink, Jesus drank fermented wine and so did the early Christians or else they would have never been accused of getting drunk at communion. The early church had fermented wine at communion and that is quite clearly the position here. They were told to be moderate and temperate. Amen. They were told to be moderate and temperate with what they were given. We are never told not to drink because it's not because it is wrong in itself. But Paul does say that if I have a brother for whom I am responsible, who cannot hold a drink and whose conscience is being hurt by it, then I must come off it. Not because it's wrong, but because of Christian love for the other person. So Paul says, I will neither eat meat nor drink wine if by doing that I am causing a weaker brother to stumble. So those who teach continuing abstinence are beginning to fall into an aesthetic heresy. So if the things that you are doing are causing your brother, your sister to fall, to stumble, then that is not of God. So God is not saying these things are bad. He's saying if you are leading another person in the wrong way doing them, then that is when it becomes an issue. And also it's having that perspective of knowing that what we are doing must be to glorify God. Amen. It shouldn't be to condemn. It shouldn't be to sin intentionally. Things that we should be doing should be done to glorify God. Amen. Which leads me into the second part of this verse. And that is um, acceptance. So it's being created by God and consecrated by gratitude. Okay. And just to repeat from our biblical reference, verses four and five say, since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. So Paul teaches that if you can thank God for it, because he created it, then it's right for you to have it. And in 1 Corinthians 10, it's clear there. All things are lawful to me. Not all things are helpful. If I can take anything that God has created, thank him for it and eat and drink, but it is not a secular activity. Whatever you drink or eat, do all for the glory of God, as it says in the word. So the basic desires of the body are good and God made them and they are to be received with thanksgiving and consecrated by the word of God and prayer. So can you imagine how difficult it will be to walk a balanced way doing everything as much as you want on the one hand and going around making laws for Christians that are not in the Bible on the other hand. It would be very difficult to do that. So this is why, again, as I emphasized earlier, us being so consumed in the word and understanding what the word of God is saying is important for us to be consistent in our journey. Amen. So this leads me to part two. So again, from our biblical reference, 1 Timothy 4, now we're going to be focusing on verses 6 to 10. 
which kind of like again continue on with the theme but start talking about the way that we must apply this amen and this is the faith so verse 6 to 10 so we must a teach for goodness or teaching for goodness so in verse 6 it reads if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters timothy you will be a worthy servant of christ jesus one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed and then b is about training for godliness so verse 7 says do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives tales instead train yourself to be godly physical training is good but training for godliness is much better promising beliefs in this life and in the life to come and then c toiling for god so first Eight says, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Sorry, verse nine. And everyone should accept it. Verse 10, this is why we work hard and continue to struggle for our hope is in the living God who is the savior of all people and particularly of all believers. So I don't believe the world will ever be one family unless men come to have one father which they don't at the moment but that is our task so in army training there are three stages to making a good soldier so stage number one is teaching which may be a sitting in a room with an officer giving talks lectures and telling them what to do after training so after teaching secondly this training in which he learns to do it himself, in which he must take part in exercises, which may not be real. So it could be practice exercises or maybe dummy bullets that they shoot with blanks, but he has got to be trained in those conditions. And then thirdly, there is the actual fighting in battle when it comes. So unless he has gone through the first two, he will let the army down in stage three. So no one can go instantly into battle if they don't know what to do. So this illustration is which both Jesus and Paul did. And behind verses 6 to 10 is a picture of Greek gymnasia. So back then they were great on physical training. They had the Olympic Games and other events. And everywhere you went in ancient Greece, they were large stadiums for sport. So here Paul is saying to Timothy that just as people train for sports, you must also train for spiritual fitness. He does not rule out the body. He says bodily exercise profits, but compared to spiritual exercise, it profits little. He does not say that it doesn't profit at all. So the three stages in spiritual fitness are teaching, training and toiling for God, which we read in verses 6 to 10 just now. So teaching is to be told the right thing. Training is to learn how to do it. And toiling is getting into the battlefield. So quite simply, you need to listen to someone teaching sound doctrine. Then you need to learn to practice that within the fellowship of the church, which is the easiest place to learn. So this is when we go to church and we learn from our pastors. Then you need to go out into the battlefield so that maybe in your homes, in your workplaces, schools or colleges, and there you will need to toil and strive for God. So we can illustrate this even more directly if you're going to be used as a witness to God. So step number one is to listen to preachers and teachers. Amen. And that's what obviously what we do in church. Like I mentioned earlier, we do that in our cell groups with our mentors, with our cell leaders. Step number two is to learn to talk about your faith to other Christians. So if you cannot open your mouth in prayer and discussion amongst Christians, you will never open it in the world. If you can't talk about Jesus to those who love him, will you ever talk to him about anyone else? So Paul is teaching Timothy, if you put these instructions before the brethren. So there is an astonishing contrast sometimes between what people call today a good minister and what the Bible calls a good minister. So a good minister is someone who will tell people these things. 
Timothy, you will be a good minister if you put these instructions before them and if you nourish yourself on the words of the faith and of good doctrine and nourish them too. To study the Bible is like having a good meal, but you must have nothing to do with godless and silly myths. You must not just tell them religious, religion and legends. Godless and silly myths are invented from the human mind. You tell them what I think and you will be a good minister. So we must train ourselves and then we can train others. So a minister has got to learn to practice what he preaches. This is where he is one tremendous advantage in being married and having a family, especially if they sit and listen to him because they make quite sure that he keeps up to what he says in the pulpit by saying, remember what you said last Sunday? It's important that we practice what we preach. So a preacher must also train as well as teach, train himself and then others and say, now you get into that group of Christians, you learn to pray, you learn to talk about Christ, learn to open your mouth, learn to train, Bodily exercise is also value, but spiritual exercise profits much. So we are always a student. Amen. And I think that's something that is applicable to us in our spiritual walk and even in our professions. We are always learning each day, especially when we communicate with others, we are learning. So again, as cell leaders, we are always learning as well. As cell members, we are always learning. As disciples of Christ doing our devotionals each day we are always learning so we have to always be in that humble position of being trained so we can then help others this is what God wants for us we can never know it all we are always a student amen so an analogy about the gym for instance is some people spend a lot of time at the gym exercising and bodybuilding and it profits like myself I like going to the gym I like um, trying to keep fit especially with my profession of dance but in the bigger perspective and spectrum it profits only little because all that time is being spent on what is for the world only or does not fall into the trap of the heretics who says that the body is evil the body is to be kept as fit as you can keep it for god's service but the kind of training that Christians need to exercise themselves is for eternity. So our spiritual training should prioritize anything else because this is where we're going to end up. Yeah, the end times are coming and we have to be ready. Amen. So when you train yourself to praise and to worship God, you are training yourself for something you are going to do forever. Physical, physical fitness will go. And that's true, as we grow older, we lose strength. But godly exercise holds promise for the present life and the future. So if you just listen to the Bible teaching and never learn to speak yourself and never learn to pray out loud yourself and never learn to talk to other Christians about Christ, then quite frankly, you will not be fit for the battle and you have missed out on essential training. So why do churches have cell groups and other meetings? It's because when you pray, when you take part, they are training you in godliness that you might be fit for the master's use and ready for the battle. You will never be that if you are just a sermon taster, i.e. if you're just someone that just attends church and just listens and does nothing about it. If you just come and listen first, that is the first step. It's not the only step and it's not the final step, it's only the first. So good to continue with the military metaphor, an army instructor might use diagrams and lectures to teach recruits how to fire a rifle. But then if he says, now go to war, even though the troops had never yet touched a gun or find one, can you imagine what would happen? Well, the enemy pops up in front of the soldiers and he runs for his book and says, now what page was it? Then he finds the right page and he says, what should I do? By that time he has done that, he will be dead. So you see, he has to translate the theoretical into the practical so his reactions will be instinctive. So if you do not learn to speak about the things of Christ among other Christians, I will tell you that will happen. 
when you are challenged about them in the world, you will say, now I will have to ask my minister about that. Next week, I'll try and get an answer for you. And has any one of you had that experience? In the past, I definitely have had that experience without really being well equipped and understanding what it is. If I'm faced with a debate with someone and I don't know the answer, it will be very embarrassing for me and also an, opp an opportunity lost for me to really promote who Jesus Christ is. So this is why we must train and be ready. Amen. So in our cell groups, it's a perfect place to talk about our faith among Christians. Then when you are asked outside that setting, you can be ready um, because you already learned how to do it in the right place. Teaching, training and toiling. So hear about it from someone else, then practice it yourself. And then you can toil and strive for the battle. So we must value our cell groups. Amen. So if there's anyone here who doesn't really attend cell or tries to put it off or brush it off aside, it's important that you prioritize it because it's giving you the right tools and the steps in order to be ready for these scenarios that we're speaking about this evening. So in verse 10, it says, for to this end, we toil and strive. So why? Because we have our hope set on the living God, who is our savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So does that mean that God is going to save everyone or that everybody is a Christian? No, the word savior means preserver and God is the preserver of all or we will not be alive today. So I believe that God stops wars at a certain point. He allows them to start and he sets a limit for the simple reason that he has said that man will not destroy the world. So we have no fears of a nuclear war that will end history. God has restrained us and preserves the human race and we should thank him that he does. But those who believe he keeps going into the next world too. So that is what is meant by this phrase and because of this we toil and strive and there is a battle that i have got to be fit for amen that you have got to be fit for that we have got to be fit for we need to be taught and trained and then go out and toil so that all men may become the special ones who believe and are saved for the next world it may be that we are called to fight to save people's lives in this world but God has called us to fight for people's freedom in the next. And to do that, we must be as fit as any soldier in the army. So it's important that we, again, learn from what we've just been speaking about. And we have to be training. Yeah, we have to be taught first. We have to train and we have to toil. We have to put that work in. We have to go out into the battlefield. And the only way that we can be confident in doing so is by self-discipline, by that spiritual training, learning the word of God, doing our devotionals, going to our cell groups, going to church, joining the life class if you haven't done it yet, and learning and just being a student. Because when we are well equipped and when we are ready and prepared, we will be preparing not only for the future, but for what's to come when jesus comes and returns amen so that's it from me this evening um so like i mentioned um we will be continuing with our study of first Timothy chapter four next week wednesday thank you all for joining hopefully you've learned something again keep your notebooks handy and ready so you can review your notes that you've taken and i will see you next week so let's end in prayer so yes, Lord, the Heavenly Father, we come before you, thanking you again for this evening, this opportunity that you've allowed us to study your word. Thank you, Lord, again for just the enlightenment and just for us to be truly ready and prepared for your return. As we spoke about wolves in sheep's clothing, I pray, Lord, that you will prepare each and every one of us, Lord Jesus, so that we are ready and that we are well equipped in your word so we will be able to discern any teaching that might not be of yours lord jesus i pray lord that we will know the word so well so if anyone is to try and confuse us we can answer back with the truth lord jesus and also may we continue to build our spiritual fitness lord jesus so that we will really be ready and prepared for any battle that may come i pray lord that we will be receptive to your word and that we will be always students lord jesus and 
have a humble heart lord jesus may we be teachable and i pray lord, that you would just guide us and lead us in the right direction lord jesus you truly are an amazing and incredible father and i pray that you continue to help us and lead us and guide us in the way that you see fit we love you and we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that only you deserve in jesus name we pray amen amen so thank you again take care and i will see you next week but before then make sure you join our um tuesday evangelistic night and also our sunday cell celebrations at joe richardson from two to five take care god bless you see you soon bye bye <laughs>